Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your interest for registering for this uh, webinar. Uh, this is, in fact, is a second round from a webinar we uh, ran at uh, the end of uh, last month. Uh, but uh, yeah, just because there was a limit in uh, participants, we, we are running it again. So let's give some, yeah, just a couple of minutes to see if everyone can log in. So some initial housekeeping. You will see in your panel, uh, there is a, a panel pane for questions. Uh, you can post them there. We will try and answer all of them at the end of the, the presentation. Also, uh, at the end of uh, the next uh, few days, we will send you a link to a recording for this uh, webinar, so you can replay it or have a look at it in, the, in your own time. Well, once again, uh, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for registering for this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Juan uh, Reyes Montes. I'm a geophysicist and consultant to ITASCA in the UK. As you know, this webinar will uh, give you a quick uh, overview of uh, INSIGHT Seismic Processor and how INSIGHT, uh, the tools within INSIGHT, fit within the general workflow for the processing of uh, seismic data at different scales. Uh, we'll try, we'll go, we'll show you a few examples of uh, applications in the field, in lab scale, and so on. Okay, so two minutes uh, after the hour, so I think we can proceed with the presentation. So, first of all, what is uh, inside a seismic processor? You can see here a few screenshots of the different views within Insight. Well, Insight is uh, quite a big tool. It's a software tool that integrates the whole of the data management, processing, analysis, and interpretation of seismic data. It's been developed over the last uh, the past uh, 20 years, and it incorporates tools that were developed for our own internal uh, research and development projects, but mostly they were implemented through the collaboration with other clients and partners. It uses, it applies to many scales. It's the processing of seismic data itself applied to many different scales from a small, uh, from testing of small lab samples and working on the acoustic emission uh, from uh, rock, uh, rock fracturing tests up to the processing, the recording and processing of uh, local, regional, and even uh, global seismic global earthquakes. Oops. And the last uh, version of Insight was released in, the, in last March, was uh, version 3.16.1, and we are expecting a new release uh, by the end of uh, June, by the end of June next month. So, what I'm showing here is what would be the full workflow for a, a seismic monitoring job. We can see that a job starts with the a design of our monitoring array, feasibility study to optimize the coverage of our monitoring array, and then move on to the setup of the project in, in the uh, in the software and in insight and then what would be the, sta the standard procedure 
uh, getting data into insight into the software uh, filtering removing uh, dc from our signal classifying our signal whether it's noise or true uh, seismic data and then the well-known process of uh, picking and locating effects and we will show the tools that cover each of these steps so to start with Going to demonstrate uh, the tools within Insight that are used in, in the design phase, in the in optimizing the position of our tools, if we can, or appraising the resolution and the errors that are inherent to the geometry of our array. So Insight has uh, tools that uh, simulate uh, perform a simulation of the performance of our array or of any hypothetical array that we're going to, to use. And the performance is evaluated through a, a number of parameters. So firstly, looking into what is the sensitivity, looking at the uh, distribution of the threshold magnitude detected in the uh, volume, in the uh, monitor volume. Misfit space, which basically looks into what is the search space, uh, how, how, how is the search space that the location algorithm will use. And therefore, this is looking into the actual uh, capability of our uh, location algorithm to converge into a robust and single solution. The shadow space analysis, which looks into uh, the number of stations that are in direct uh, line of sight, that it's taking into account any voids, any objects that might obscure our uh, seismic signal. And finally, oh, not finally, <laughs> another tool is the simulation of errors. Uh, it, it, it runs a Monte Carlo simulation, basically uh, performs location multiple times and comes with a distribution of uh, potential solutions for a well-located event. And finally, it can also generate uh, synthetic waveforms, uh, taking into account the uh, medium, the information that we have about the medium, and how this, uh, the arrivals from a, a seismic event will be seen through uh, across our, our array. So, to demonstrate this, I'm going to show you an example um, with an insight. Let's open insight. Here we go. So this is the first window that we find in, in Insight, the start window. And it's basically, it's um, uh, very similar to a Windows Explorer. We have uh, empty panels at this time because we don't have any events yet. But basically we have a panel on the left which will show folders of events that we have in our project. And on the right hand, we will have uh, each uh, a list of all the individual events with four of their of their parameters: uh, location, source parameters, mechanism, time, etc. Okay, so let's go to uh, the 3D visualizer, which is the visualizer where we can perform the simulations that were uh, that were discussing before. So this is the a project. Has been set up. It is a monitoring project for a gallery uh, tunnel that was excavated for a nuclear waste repository site. And it has a number of stations. In this case, it's uh, monitored through the uh, 16 uh, micro seismic stations that, that surround our uh, tunnel, our gallery. So this, because it's uh, should be a very good coverage, but let's have a look at the performance of this array analysis. So this is a tool, array analysis, which opens with uh, general settings. Well, basically the volume that we're interested in analyzing, we define it here. Then the plane that we're gonna output uh, for to, to have a look at our results. So we can output the results in three different planes. So uh, one plan view and two side views oriented across the 
uh, north and east uh, directions. The resolution of the solution we're going to see. And where do we want to store our uh, solution, our examples, uh, our uh, simulations? Uh, next step is setting up the properties of uh, the location algorithm because it, this is a crucial algorithm that we uh, need to check for the performance of our array. So here we set up the algorithm that we're going to use uh, and the properties uh, for it. So the minimum number of arrivals, the maximum residual we're going to consider, and if we click on settings, we can further define properties of our medium. In our example here now, we're going to use a very simple homogeneous medium, because in fact how it is, and we're going to see simplex uh, location. We, we, we will go through this uh, later. So let's have a look at the first uh, simulation, which is the uh, sensitivity, looking at the uh, threshold magnitude <clears throat> that will be detected across our volume. So this takes into account uh, the properties of the medium by introducing density of the rock, uh, a Q factor, this is the attenuation that we expect to have in this rock, and also the sensitivity of our tools, the tools that we're going to use in here. We can also introduce the minimum number of uh, peaks that we will need, or we think we will need to uh, perf uh, to detect and, and successfully process our event, and the maximum or the minimum, sorry, <laughs> minimum signal to noise ratio that we want to have in order to detect uh, our events. So let's run it. This should be pretty good. And let's have a look at how uh, the results are output. So these are the results. I'm going to close this window now. So yeah, the results are output as a density plane. If we right click on it, we can um, go, we can see the scale. And we can see here that, that uh, dark blue means the highest sensitivity because it's uh, uh, an event of magnitude of in this case, instrument magnitude minus 4.3 can be detected in areas of uh, dark blue. And of course, uh, as we expected, the low sensitivity is found at the edges of our array and outside of uh, the uh, volume covered by our array. So it's a good coverage, it's highly sensitive. And as we want to have, it's very homogeneously uh, covering uh, the area around our excavation, which is where most of the events are expected to be located. Okay, so I can now hide uh, this uh, result to uh, output the next one. And let's have a look at the misfit space. In this case, the simulation is uh, it will we input a position for a theoretical event. In this case, I've put it on the roof of our tunnel and what it will do it's display what would be the residual the shape of uh, our residual our search space for the array that we have so a good solution would be as we have it's um, minimum a very well defined minimum and single ideally well defined around the position of our theoretical event and this is what we're having. So uh, this tells us that uh, the location algorithm will likely su uh, be successful in the location because the solution, the search space is well defined. The solution is well defined and there are no potential local minima or broad areas of uh, low residual uh, to search. Okay, so Gonna hide this. I'm gonna now run uh, the last simulation, which is the others, but take a bit longer, but just to speed this up. The Monte Carlo simulation, and this is a way of estimating what it's the uncertainty that we will have in our locations. And we run several locations. So this is 250, just to uh, speed the process. You can go. Uh, for a higher number. 
and we input what would be the expected uncertainty in our uh, velocity model and also the expected uncertainty in our peaking in determining the arrival of the p and s waves uh, the software what it will do it's it will add a random uh, a gaussian distributed uh, random error uh, in our process so an error in the uh, velocity model and an error in the peaking of our event and it will try and locate uh, an event located uh, in a, a well-known position the position i defined before so let's uh, let's run it yeah so it's done it let's have a look and the result is um, yeah a number of a cluster of events in this case 250 events that we can see are look around the position of the true location so this could be taken in our case as the uncertainty for the location if we study the distribution of these events we'll show you later how we can uh, evaluate this this will give us an idea of what is expected uncertainty in our uh, locations okay so let's move on to our uh, next step which is oops, bringing data, bringing uh, events into our into our project. We can bring them in two ways. One is directly importing uh, events that have been processed through a different uh, software, through a different uh, equipment, or events that have not been processed but have been triggered. Uh, and have been acquired uh, as uh, in trigger mode or we can uh, stream we can uh, go through the full continuous stream of uh, seismic data and harvest extract events uh, from them which is what we're going to show and how is it done so very simple uh, in this window we're showing an example of um, uh, seismic stream acquired through uh, 12 uh, triaxial geophones and we can see we can detect because we can visually see that there are some arrivals multiple arrivals here so what does the software do well it goes through uh, the complete trace with the double window method in which is comparing the amplitude of the signal at the front and the amplitude of the signal at the back of this window and when it detects that the amplitude of the front exceeds our own criterion for what would be a, a, an event, then the software will extract, will cut a section around it and will work with that as the trace corresponding to, to an event. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, insight. And how this is done. So we can see here we're back to the start window, which is empty at the moment. So we can directly import data. As I said before, we can import data that has been pre processed or pre triggered by a different uh, software, by different equipment. Uh, you can see there are several, quite a long list of uh, formats. Some of them are standard industrial formats. Uh, others are proprietary for some uh, systems, but this, uh, yeah, we keep adding uh, <clears throat> new data formats to this list, and we can directly import them as we will do with in, in any uh, software. But we're going to look at continuous stream in this case. And how does it work? Uh, basically, uh, we need to define a search. Uh, directory that's where we are storing our raw data uh, the raw stream and then we need to define uh, two uh, other folders one for the storage of psfs these are inside uh, files uh, inside will create one file uh, for each event and that file will store the waveform for that event uh, for all traces in that event and also any results that we have, any results 
after processing that event will be stored in that uh, file uh, for each event. And BSFs, which are the same type of files, just uh, for backup for, uh, for backup purposes. So, how can we detect our events? You can see here there are several methods. An amplitude threshold. This would be basically simply if we estimate that going above a certain magnitude is an event, a uh, certain amplitude is an event, then the software will detect, will extract it. A bit more complex, but you can use the picking algorithm, which is the method we're going to uh, demonstrate at the moment, which is this double window I talked about before, in which we have a front window, which is defined here, a front window and a back window, different sizes, and we give a threshold, which means, in this case, if the amplitude at the front is twice the amplitude at the back, that it's an arrival, that will be an, an event, and we will extract a section from it. Uh, to make sure that we avoid uh, serious uh, uh, spikes on a single, tool, we normally use the criteria of uh, using that on multiple instruments, so we will ask the software uh, that uh, uh, the stream must exceed this threshold on at least three instruments in this case. So let's run it. I'm going to open the watch, which will give us some feedback in real time of the information uh, of what is happening, of the processing processes that are going on. And let's start uh, triggering. So, yeah, it's telling us that there are already 100 files in the raw data storage. Do we want to uh, run through them? Yes. So it is running through them. You can see it's quite fast uh, to read, but we can export the results of this uh, log into, into a text file. But it's telling us every time that it finds uh, trigger, which file it found the trigger, and what time that event was uh, detected. Uh, this tool is built for real time, so basically uh, it will keep looking into the uh, folder for new files coming in, if we are working, if we are acquiring data. In this case, we're not acquiring any data, so when it reaches the end, it's just telling us that there are no new files, but it keeps open uh, looking for them. So close it, because it's finished, we've got all of them here, and we can see now uh, our windows are starting to populate. Uh, we've got a folder here that contains all the triggers that it's found uh, in this uh, stream. If we right click on one of them, we can check our traces just to have a look at the quality of our triggers. So, yeah, it's a reasonable arrival, so they likely correspond to true events. We can go back to our data anytime if we think we have not detected enough events or if we think we have been triggering on noise and it's too sensitive. And we can change, we can edit the properties, uh, the parameters in our uh, list, in our detection. Okay, so let's move on to the next step in processing once we have the events and we have classified them and we know they are really events, they are not noise or they are not man made shots. If they are uh, true events, the next step is picking, is marking the arrival of the different phases in our trace. And the process is very similar. To what we've done for leaching is uh, it's a double window so we can pick manually but the auto picking will work using a double window with the front and the back and it will compare uh, the amplitude at the front and the amplitude at the back if we have any further information uh, about the behavior of our events that it's uh, any changes in Frequency and changes in polarization will characterize an arrival. We can also use this as a criteria 
uh, for this comparison. That's what we, what we call the picking function. So it's not only amplitude, we can use any other uh, pieces of information that we have. So let's go back to inside and show you some how it works. So here we have, we're back to uh, this example, uh, which we have. So we got some waveforms. Yeah, we have here very good arrivals. Uh, this is a field uh, case uh, for a hydraulic fracturing job where we have a vertical uh, downhole array. And we have here the arrivals of the P and the S waves. They are quite clear, so we can easily pick them manually. It's not difficult, but uh, it would be tedious if we want to go through a full uh, catalog of data. So INSEC has here uh, the, uh, the window, the, I mean, the parameters to define the auto picking. And what can we do? What can we, what parameters can we use? Well, you can see here we define size of our window, different for the P wave and the S wave. Uh, so basically, they are, they are different. Uh, the way, uh, one of them comes after the P wave, so uh, in the, probably in the code of it, in, in fact. So, yeah, so we have to define them separately. Uh, we, by default, inside, we'll try and search first for the P wave and then S wave, but we can change this behavior in case the S wave is well, it's very clear to uh, detect, and the P wave is not so clear. So we can search for it first and then go back and search for the P wave. And well, basically, yeah, we can also use different uh, ways of detecting our events. So this is based purely on amplitude, but by using the Akaike information. Uh, method, which is defined here. So here, yeah, yeah, we can input more uh, parameters, other ways of searching for this bit. Okay. So let's run it. Uh, let's run the auto pick for the P. Let's run the auto pick for the S. We can see it's not uh, worked very well. We can change the parameters in our picking to optimize this, or we can manually adjust it. But as we will see in the next uh, tool, we don't need to have a precise picking for all our stations because the location algorithm will work on what would be the best fit for the majority of our picks. And I'm going to show you another tool that we have. It's okay, the picking didn't work very well, like in this case. So I'm going to go to this instrument and manually pick. So I manually pick my arrival, my P wave. I manually pick my wave. And then we can use this tool here, which is the LEN. It's basically, it's, we are educating the software to search for these uh, arrivals. So based on my manual picking, the software analyzes uh, how this arrival is and will give us what would be the best uh, parameters, uh, the best uh, sizes of the windows and best threshold, picking threshold that we can use based on this pick. We can update the properties in our pick button to work in uh, automatically, to automatically detect these arrivals. So we can see now that it, yeah, if we run the auto pick, it goes there it's precisely because it's based on what we've told it to, to yeah, what we've told it to do. This works very well in case we, all of our events are similar. And this happens in many projects where events have a similar pattern in terms of amplitude and arrivals. Okay, so back to our workflow and the next and probably the most important step in uh, working with um, seismic data set 
is the location of our events. This is what we work, normally work with. We want to detect where, we want to detect our events, but most importantly, we want to know where they come from because that characterizes our fractures. Uh, that uh, will give us information of the damage that we have induced in a rock sample or where the fracture in our hydraulic fracturing job is uh, growing in it. So, Insight can work with uh, a wide range of uh, velocity models that cover the standard uh, conditions that we have in any project. To start with, uh, with homogeneous isotropic model, very simple model. Uh, normally, that's the starting point if we want to have a quick result or we don't have uh, good information of our uh, medium. We can introduce a uh, degree of anisotropy, global anisotropy. We can also work with layer models that can be homogeneous or isotropic as well. But we can also introduce a higher degree of complexity. And this is typical context that we have in uh, mines or projects that have voids or any structures within our medium that are not well represented by a simple uh, layer model. And also we can work with time dependent models. This is a model, a velocity model that changes uh, with time. And well, we will see in the next section that's very typical. That's what happens in any standard rock fracturing job because uh, initially we start with uh, conditions of an intact rock and at the end we have a fracture that has developed. So the velocity cannot be the same at the beginning as, as it is at the end. The algorithm to work with these uh, velocity models, well, you can see here for homogeneous medium, we have a Gelder uh, method, which is basically inverting for the travel time equations, or a search method, a guided search method, which is a simplex method, which is quite fast and quite effective in this uh, medium. But a more general method for working with any medium, we have the collapsing research and the uh, source scan. And I'm gonna show you in the next uh, slides what they, uh, uh, how they work. So collapsing research, what is, what is it? It's basically an, exhaust, an exhaustive search. Uh, so it goes through every point in our, in our uh, monitor volume, through every point, and compares the theoretical and the observed arrivals. And through comparing them, it finds what would be the best fit, what minimizes the, the, the residual of the differences in between them, and that will give us the location. Why is it collapsing? Well, basically because it, it starts with a coarse search, and then it increases the resolution of the search by focusing around the areas where the minimum is uh, located, so the best fit is located. And this is an iterative process. It continues <clears throat> iterating through it until it reaches the target uh, resolution. And what's the other method that we discussed, the other general method? It's a source scan. The difference in between them is uh, the source scan can work with the more general objective uh, functions. So it's not purely looking at arrival times, but it is almost it's a migration method that it's looking at the energy within our trace. And it's trying to match what would be the best fit uh, um, for the energy found in the different points in our trace compared with the energy traveling from points in our search volume, how they will arrive into our receivers. So the main advantage of this is that we don't need, and we don't necessarily need uh, to detect the arrival of other phases. It will work on just what would be the amplitude, the energy content of our, in our trace. But not only energy, we can also introduce other uh, parameters such as polarization, uh, yeah, degree of uh, 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 frequency content, et cetera can introduce all the criteria in this uh, search. Right, so let's have a look in Insight. 
uh, and we've got here a couple of examples. I'm going to go very quickly through them. We've got here a couple of examples. Uh, so here we have we're we're going back uh, to the uh, case of um, the um, a mine. So the gallery. I'm going to show you in the 3D visualizer. So we are, and we have some events located at the, at the roof and the floor of our gallery, as we remember this before. So let's have a look at one of these uh, events. Uh, if we right click on it, let's have a look at the waveforms that we have in it. Yeah, so once they've been picked, we can run the location by just simply clicking on it. And this will demonstrate how the process of location works. It, uh, it's pretty fast because uh, it's very uh, good array. But the window, uh, the output here shows you the steps in the location. And we can see all the different passes. In this case, we are using the Geiger algorithm uh, combined with the simplex. And it does several passes. It goes through an initial pass. And we can see at the end that, well, basically all of the arrivals are good. They all have a residual that's below the minimum uh, one that we have defined. So no need to drop it. So yeah, basically single pass uh, resulted in a location, in a good location. I'm gonna use, show you now uh, a different example for which the conditions are not so good. This is the one that we uh, worked uh, before, what we saw before. Yeah, you can see here, not all the peaks are so good. So in this case, we're gonna use, I'm gonna show you protect this, a layer model. So here we define the velocity structure. We have defined it uh, using a text file. In this case, that defines all our layers. And we're gonna use the uh, collapsing grid search. You can see here we've defined a minimum number of arrivals. So if we don't have more than four good arrivals, uh, the event will not be detected. And we have defined a maximum residual. So the software will drop any Readings that for which the difference in between the arrival, the observed arrival time, and the theoretical one are above, in this case, uh, four uh, milliseconds. If the difference is above that, it will drop that read. Okay, so let's have a look at the location. How it works. You can see here it's a bit slower because it's a more complex velocity model. It is a velocity model, really, that normally controls the uh, what the time that it takes to an event but also the resolution and the size of the search volume that we're using so we can see here it's taken over 20 seconds but importantly we can see that uh, there are several passes and at the end of each pass it's been dropping arrivals basically because the detected P wave arrival, it's not following the pattern that it's being observed for the rest. And we can see it's dropped instrument number seven because yeah, the picking wasn't ideal, was quite quite bad. Yeah. In the next pass, it will drop uh, station number 10. Yeah. And it carries on, it will drop then number five. So it will drop all the ones that don't match well, what is the best fit uh, defined by the rest of the stations. But at the end, it produces a location. We can see here where we have uh, several lines, um, a dark blue line that it's the picking, the, the auto pick, a light blue that it's the theoretical arrival for the final location that we have. And you can see, yeah, it's a good fit to most of the arrivals, not so good for some of them, but in fact, those are the ones that were dropped. 
and we have the same for the S wave. We have a dark line, which is the thick, and a light a line that it's the theoretical. Uh, and we can see now the events. We can uh, go to the three D. You can see here our event uh, located. If we can, if we can find it, we can ask it. Yeah, where is it? Yeah, in case we have uh, more events. All right. So we've uh, reached basically what would be the uh, main uh, processing uh, for seismic event. Where else we have located? But there is an important step, and I'm going to go back to the presentation, which is that location relies heavily on having a good velocity model. So we need to calibrate it, or if we can. Uh, normally, our location is probably as good as our picking, but also as good as our uh, knowledge of the velocity model that we are using. Uh, for that reason, uh, we can use uh, velocity models that are based on servers. And this is where why we define this time-dependent velocity model. We have here the example of a, a rock fracturing test. In the lab, uh, we can see initially we have an almost intact uh, sample that's been started to fracture uh, at one of the edges. And at the end, we have a quite persistent uh, fracture that crosses the whole sample. So the velocity model cannot be the same, at least for the events that are being processed at this stage, as it is for the events that are processed at the end. And for that, we can use regular uh, uh, active surveys that give us the velocity model, the velocity across different ray paths uh, across our sample. Uh, so this is easy to do in the lab, but yeah, we can see here if INSIGHT has the tools to use this periodical uh, velocity surveys, display what's been observed through them, and use them to produce a velocity model. As I was saying, this was easy, easy in the lab, but in the field, we have to work with other ways of calibrating our velocity model. And well, this is typically done by calibration shots. Uh, we can use, if it's a hydraulic fracturing job, we can use the shots that are performed at the start of each of the stages, calibration shots. We can use uh, shots that are done through a string in our uh, well, or we can use any other known shot and you're on a well-known position on the surface, uh, use, use a bike there, etc. Worst case scenario, we can use a good event that it's located at the, in, at the start of any stage, and we can assume that it's locating at the uh, injection point, and use that to calibrate our velocity. So INSIGHT has the tools to calibrate our velocity model based on uh, this. And I'm going to demonstrate them. I'm going back to a couple of uh, projects and inside. Go. And here we are back. Uh, we have here an example. I'm going to show you the geometry of this example. We have a hydraulic fracturing job uh, on a deviated well, horizontal well in this case, monitor through a vertical array that is positioned in a neighboring well, and we have a number of perf shots, initiation points. So we can use the recording of one of them, which we can have a look at them. Uh, so we can see they have very clear arrivals, so we can use these uh, shots because we know where they are and we have good arrivals for them, we can use them to calibrate our velocity. So let's do that. We call the tool that is called the frag manager and we left click on the um, panel corresponding to the stages that we're working with and we select the option to calculate the velocity model using the calibration shots. 
<clears throat> so this opens this dialog in which we have a number of shots. I'm going to remove a few of them just to speed up the process. That's going to leave some of them that correspond to the last stages. So how does it work? We have to select an and starting velocity model. The velocity model can be homogeneous to start with, but it is better if we start with a layer model and we can define it graphically here. Uh, let's focus on the uh, region of interest. I'm going to maximize it so it is clear. So this is our log. A log. We have a log for the P wave and the S wave that is performed yeah, around the uh, depth where our tools are positioned. So this is actually the uh, region of interest. So we have a P wave, S wave, velocity log, and we also have a gamma, gamma log. Gamma log is used as a proxy to calculate uh, the Thompson parameters. We can also use the inverse of the P wave as another proxy for these uh, Thompson parameters. So we can introduce some layers in it. We introduce them mostly around the area of interest, the depth range of interest. Yeah. And inside what it's done, it's calculate the average velocity from these logs around each of them. We can adjust this. And if we right click on one of them, you can see the values of it. But the important thing that we are going to use here is we're going to give uh, the software the freedom to change these velocities on a, by a range. In this case, we're going to allow it to move, let's say, 500 meters per second. So in this case, no, we are using feet, so let's go. Let's give it more flexibility. Yeah, probably something like this. So we give it a flexibility to move our velocities, to change our velocities below and above uh, the values that we have uh, observed, uh, we have defined here. We apply to all layers. And we also have uh, the flexibility to, to calculate uh, the Thompson parameters to vary them from either the gamma log, uh, the inverse of the VP, or really change them. But yeah, we're not going to uh, calculate that, but it will be varying them also to come with what would be the best fit velocity model based on our calibration shots. So we have this, I'm going to close it and it will tell me, yeah, I want to save this uh, velocity model. It is here. And yeah, let's uh, start the calibration. It will take a while uh, because what it's doing, it's varying our existing velocity model and come up with which is the uh, fit for the shots that we're using. In this case, we're only using four shots to calibrate all this more. And here is the solution. It's on this side and it's pretty good actually. I'm going to bring them in. So what it does, it is showing us uh, an output of what it's the difference in between the observed uh in red the observed travel times for our shots and what is the calibrated solution for them when it's trying to locate them uh, well we can see it's uh, quite a good fit so if we're happy with that it is giving us this is the velocity model that it's come up with if we want to use it we can export it save it as a text file, and then we can bring it, use it in our version. Okay, I'm gonna show you on the other tool that I mentioned before, which is, let's assume that we have uh, surveys. 
that we, in this case, this example that we have here. Apologies, I'm gonna, one. here it is. So this is a, an example from a rock fracturing test in the lab. It's a cylindrical sample for which each of these uh, sensors switch in between active and passive mode. So they, when they are active, they send a signal across our sample, it's detected on the other uh, sensors, and inside the software calculates uh, what it's the velocity uh, corresponding to that. So it knows the shift time and the arrival time. It does that periodically, so we can come up with a velocity model at the end of our, uh, with several velocity models uh, at the end of our experiment. So I'm gonna quickly show you the tools uh, for doing this. So this is a chart that will show the result for the uh, surveys for the velocity, in this case, the T wave velocity, uh, for each of the surveys that have been performed. In this case, we have only performed one, so it's not nothing showing. But we can also have a look at what is the velocity model, what is the results from the first survey, and we can also have a look at the difference in between. the reference survey and the latest. In case, I'm gonna simulate that we are working with uh, in real time, we would be importing uh, new surveys into our project. You can see as we import surveys, we are starting to populate results. I'm gonna change the properties in this chart because it is yeah. okay. So let's bring uh, more service, and you can see as we are bringing service, damage is uh, developing in our sample. There are some differences uh, compared with what would be the reference events. Okay. And let's bring in the last one. Right. So what do we have here? And we have A series of that this some damage developed at the end. So what it will what we can ask the software and let's is to export this velocity model. And it, it will be exported as a text file, CSV file. That comes in our location already. What will this file contain? We will contain the P wave of the fastest ray path, the difference with the lowest, and what would be the azimuth. Will be the atmosphere for this slowest uh, ray path. But it will use that as to define an anisotropic uh, velocity. So we're reaching the end of our uh, project, of our example project, and what's the final, uh, uh, the final task that we normally carry on? Well, it's analyzing our results. And there are di many different analyses, I'm going to only show you. A couple of them in insight but the main one is just well basically have a look at where our events locate uh, how do they develop in time the distribution of magnitudes but also we can appraise uh, with an estimate of what is the uncertainty that we had in our processing in our locations 
So well, I'm going to demonstrate this using a different example. In this case, this is good um, emissions detected around a couple of uh, boreholes. These are boreholes for the storage of uh, nuclear rat waste. And these boreholes were heated and they, of course, it's resulted in the induction of fractures around them. So we have some acoustic emissions defined and offset. Uh, and this is just to demonstrate uh, some of the ways to visualize our events. We can use a scale for time, I mean, a color scale, but we can scale to any of this uh, list of parameters. A useful one, I'm going to demonstrate this time, use that. Uh, but also we can change the uh, size of the events to match, uh, typically magnitude is a typical parameter that we can use. If we apply this, yeah, you can see this is a good display to visually analyze what it's the position and what it's the patterns that we have in our, oops, Sorry, in our session city. But we can also show them in time. We can also play in time because the way fractures grow can be also informed, can be useful in our flow. So yeah, you can see here factory, factory developing from top down in this borehole and then back. So I'll demonstrate some of the tools that we have in um, I'm gonna end now with uh, another example. In this case, going back to the field the, uh, case that we worked up uh, worked before, in which we have a couple of uh, hydraulic fractures defined induced along a vertical well. And this is just to show. Uh, that uh, another tool that will display what will be the error is the error around our uh, location. It will display the wall. I click OK. What we will do is it will build. This is useful because we can see if. The residual is well defined or not, and that correlates directly to confidence that we have in our location. So, yeah, you can see the residual is located around the true location or the uh, location given to us for, for the software. But we can see, yeah, there's a degree of uncertainty in how well defined it is in the vertical. So, there's a degree of uncertainty in the Z vertical position of our. Of our Other tools are well calculating what would be the volume encompassed, or the volume defined by the whole of our seismicity. We can yeah, fit uh, an SEO surface around our events, and if we click on it, properties it will give us uh, what, would, what would be volume included in that. Uh, or defined by our seismicity and the area uh, defined uh, by it. And this somehow corresponds to stimuli. So, this is a quick overview of our software. Uh, we go through questions now. And, well, going back to the uh, presentation, there are plenty more examples in our website, as well as a free version of the software for you to, to use and go through these examples more examples in our YouTube channel. And you can always contact us at idasica.co.uk with any questions, any queries about what Insight can do for your particular application. So I think it's time now to close this presentation, go through any questions that we have. Uh, Hi Juan, yes, we've got um, two questions from Ali. Uh, his yep. first one, he, he was wondering in slide 14, 
how frequently did you update the velocity tomography? For example, did you do it every 10 minutes? Uh, sorry, yeah, back here, uh, slide 14, yeah. Yeah. How frequently? Yes, Ooh, that depends on basically on, on, your, on your experiment. Uh, it, they normally don't take long. They take uh, around, probably would say around a second per instrument. Per vapor. And of course, it depends. Uh, during the time of the surveys, you are not acquiring data. You are not acquiring passive data. So you are, the trade off is you are doing a survey, but you are missing the acoustic emissions at that interval of time. So you want to space them so that you don't interrupt your acquisition for too long. Uh, for a one, two hour experiment, yeah, it, a good spacing is doing this around. 10 to 15 minutes. Also, you can change the periodicity of this because normally the changes are not too dramatic at the start of your experiment, but they are more dramatic at the end. So you might want to have more frequent uh, service at the end. But it's a trade-off because yeah, you need to, need to take into account that you are losing acoustic emission data at the time you're performing your survey. So, yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> good and difficult. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, his second question is on uh, wave attenuation. It's um, a little bit long, so I apologize if I get this, make a mistake. Is Insight capable of taking attenuation into account? Um, for example, we have a hydro hydraulic fracturing test on a rock sample. And as the injection continues, the saturation, saturation of the fluid increases and the velocity is changing or yeah. depending on the excitement of the sensor producing the pulse. Uh, sometimes the velocity is changing due to the attenuation. In other, other words, attenuation could be frequency dependent. And so the question on this is, what kind yeah. of typical frequency do you suggest by which attenuation does not depend on the frequency? Right, yes, uh, very good, very good question. <laughs> Again, difficult one. Uh, so the only way to that insight working automatically uh, takes into account the attenuation is through uh, the Q factor. So we can define a different Q factor per layer or, or a global Q factor, Q attenuation factor for, for all layers in our model. Now, this is very general and it's, as you say, it's very much frequency dependent. And yeah, the only way to overcome this is what it's at the, at the point of filtering our signal. And we do that, we can. Uh, uh, so, uh, apologies, change processing. And we define uh, the, uh, our, our filtering here. And filtering can be different, uh, we can define a different filter per instrument and we can also make it change with time uh, if, if needed. Attenuation, as you know, affects very highly wave arrivals and higher frequency. And for a typical hydraulic fraction, we tend to work in, in the range of between 100 and 600 hertz, as they are not very effective. We don't see much impact on them. Uh, by that, we are probably altering uh, the P wave arrival because that's the most high effect. But yeah, to summarize, we can only work with, uh, with Q factor uh, to take into account attenuation and yeah, defining uh, our filter uh, in here, which can be done individually per instrument or globally, and be adapting it with time as well. this answer your question. Okay. Uh, any more? Um, yes, Ali says thank you for that. Um, yes, I've got another, I've got a question from Willem. Uh, can we know or predict the creep of the rock? Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, not with microseismicity. <laughs> I would I would say that probably uh, working together with other 
the rest of the Itasca software really, uh, this is not a predictive uh, tool. This is an observational tool. And creep by nature is not very seismic. It's uh, more it's more quiet and seismic. And it's not something that insight will work with. Insight will work basically with the seismic signals. But we can combine our observations with uh, as an input for other bits of uh, other pieces of software for software such as uh, Slack or PFC that will use seismicity as an input and from that we'll be able to work with a seismic behavior such as creep in, in a signal. So hopefully this answers your question. <laughs> Um, and that's it on for the questions, Juan. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. We've been slightly over the hour that we estimated initially, but thank you very much for your attention. As I'm going to bring back our slide uh, presentation. So, with yeah, you know where you can find. Going to the end. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you can find us in our website and uh, we will be sending you uh, a recording of uh, this uh, webinar and a questionnaire for you to answer uh, as a part. And yeah, we are here to listen to you uh, in this email or our website. Once again, thank you very much and hope you have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Juan.